morning. This is Bill from Curious Cars and Auto House of Naples on a miserable, muggy, shitty Florida Friday. I mean, there's just no talking around it. It sucks. The humidity is back in the air. Uh, you know, it tricked me a little bit because last night there was some sort of little cool breeze. And when I took my hound for a walk, it was nice. It was pleasant. There was, you know, a chill. Not Well, not quite a chill, but, you know, the weather was good. And, and I thought, okay, we're going to have a decent morning tomorrow. Well, no. It turns out we're not. It's going to be this humid fog of doom that just absolutely depresses you and uh, lets you know that the rest of the day is going to be crap. So I've got that going for me now. Um, secondary to that, what can I tell you? You know, it's been a while again since a video. I'm on a little bit of a... I don't know what you'd call it. Uh, you know, I haven't had many cars get ready that I want to do. And that's a problem. I've got to come up with some interesting shit to do a video on. Uh, in fact, I picked this one, even though it doesn't frankly excite me very much. And I'm sure it doesn't excite you either. But it does have a fascinating story. And uh, it is something that I can check off the box. Because I have wanted to do one before. So I thought, what the hell? I'm going to grab this thing and do it. And uh, at least we'll get one up this week and you know hopefully we can have some more next week but um, uh, more or less this is just gonna check a box off uh, I'm deep into the coronavirus oh no there I go it's not the it's I'm deep into the anti-soviet uh, whiskey this morning because you know I just don't know. I've been following the news a little bit. It's a little bit hard to follow. I'm not really sure how the Soviets are doing. Some days I think they're doing bad. Other days I think they're doing well. So um, better just to be safe than sorry and have a few tugs off the flask and uh, make sure that, um, you know, I'm well protected from any Soviets that might be, you know, hanging around. You know, that could be a Soviet there in that little shitty SUV. There could be one behind the bushes. You know, who knows? Soviets could pop up anywhere. So with the whiskey in me, I'm going to be in good shape to handle that. And what this is going to be, I promise this time, is going to be a short take on this Ford Mustang. Uh, and one of the reasons it's going to be a short take is because my glasses are again fogged up and I can't really see it. So I'm only focusing on this sort of burgundy blog, uh, blob in, fr in front of me and hoping that it's the car and, uh, you know, not something else that's been set up there. So we're going to dive. We're going to leap directly into this car. And I mean, this, this video, it's going to be so short that people are going to wonder what the hell is up. What's going on? It's going to be that short. And uh, this is kind of exciting. So this is going to be, oh, I may even put it in the title. This is going to be a short take on this, uh, on this Mustang. And what this Mustang is, is a 1998 Ford Mustang SVT Cobra. Uh, SVT standing for Special Vehicle Team, which we'll get into, you know, as we go. And the Mustang, of course, is a giant topic. I mean, it's an enormous topic. The idea that I could even begin to scratch the surface in a short video is a joke, so we're just not going to. Um, and frankly, the Cobra is a big topic, you know, with Carroll Shelby and his relationship with Ford and, uh, you know, all that sort of stuff. You could fill up books, and people, of course, have. So, um, you know, we're not going to get into that either. This short take is going to, we're going to focus in on how this car, this particular car, uh, the fourth generation Mustang was not meant to be. And uh, we'll see why as we go. And in fact, I'm sure a lot of people already know, but the hell with it. We're going to do it anyway. And, you know, to a large extent, Mustangs are a victim of their own success. Uh, they're common. Lots of them out there, widely visible, and so over-represented over that they kind of border on the banal. I mean, you just, you can't take a drive down to the convenience store without seeing a Mustang somewhere. And that's why I can stand here and be somewhat unmoved by an American car, uh, a four-seat convertible with a hand-built 32-valve V8, a BorgWarner 5-speed, and uh, brakes and suspension that are basically tuned for road racing. You know, I mean, here I am looking at this thing, and I'm thinking, eh, yeah, it's another Mustang. But I mean, you know, it's everything that a car guy would ask for uh, from a manufacturer, certainly in 1998. And uh, it's just a shame. That, I mean, they should have built far fewer Mustangs, and then this thing would be a lot more exciting. 
exciting. Uh, but uh, look, whether or not it moves me is entirely irrelevant. Uh, Mustangs do move the American public and a growing global market. I had a big argument with the people at work the other day. You know, I was pointing out that the, the Miata was probably the world's greatest sports car. And they laughed and they laughed. And I said, you know, oh, the Mustang is the best selling sport. The Mustang isn't a sports car. I mean, it's got four seats. It's a big, I mean, it's anything but a sports car. I mean, I, you put a big V8 in one, fine, it's a street racer, but it's not a sports car. And, uh, you know, apparently, no, I'm crazy. The Mustang is, uh, they're, sorry, the Miata is just for hairdressers. It's not a sports car. And uh, it just continues to make me live through a miserable, horrible existence that... Mm, <sighs> One of these days, that radar tracking station in the North Atlantic, that's where I'm going to end up. And I'll be very happy, either that or a cabin, you know, in the uh, Tennessee wilderness. And I won't let anyone within a rifle range. And uh, I'll be happy about that. Uh, quick aside, I am thinking about making a Twitter account for Curious Cars. After all this Elon Musk shit that's going on, you know, I've had a Twitter account for years. I dusted it off. I went fucking around Twitter the other day. And I thought, well, you know, it might be a fun place to have some conversations about cars. No promises, because every time I make promises, they fail. Uh, but I might today make a Curious Cars Twitter account, and we'll see. So, you know, any of you guys who feel like you want to might discuss this further, have a look. There's a chance there'll be a Curious Cars account by tonight on Twitter, and we'll see if we can't talk about a few things. Uh, but anyway, I'll, I digress. So look, um, we're talking about iconic cars. We do that a lot on this channel. You know, every time I find something that I think is a big iconic, you know, something that has spread itself around the world and is very recognizable, I like to do. And this is one of those, not this particular Mustang, but the Mustang in general. You'd have to say it's in the top five of cars in the world that people know. I mean, it's just one of those things. And in particular... Maybe even the top three. I mean, it's just the Mustang is a is an iconic car for Ford. I mean, you're talking Lee Iacocca. It's basically his creation, and it has captivated the hearts of quite a few people. Uh, you know, for I don't know what he made it in 1964 and a half. Here it is, like almost 60 years later, and people still love Mustangs. So, um, so there it is. But look, this is again not going to be about the long and storied history of uh, Ford's pony car. It's going to be about how this particular car, uh, this fourth generation Mustang, was not meant to be, and how it was saved by a small group of dedicated fanatics at Ford, because it's a very cool story, and for the people who don't know what they should. You know, it's one of the rare times when the will of the people uh, overcame the, uh, you know, the stupidity of corporations and the bean counters within them. And uh, afterwards, I'll also go over this particular car a little bit, but we'll start with this. So, look, after its wild success in the 1960s, the Mustang had been well, it was pretty badly mismanaged in the 70s. I mean, it went from being this hard-charging, well, okay, in 64 and a half, the first Mustangs, you know, they were famously called secretary's cars. And there was some truth to that. I mean, the Chevelle was a more, you know, manly piece. You know, you get an old six-cylinder Mustang, and it's not exactly what you'd call something a, a guy's going to drip testosterone out of. But, of course, the muscle car era was flowing at that time. And here you've got this great little pony car car that you could put a V8 in, and it became uh, one of the seminal muscle cars of the mid to late 60s, you know, and especially after Carroll Shelby got his hands on them, and they became, uh, you know, the giant V8s, and, uh, you know, the famous story Hertz renting the, the GT350s, there were GT500s, uh, it was a very big deal, and, uh, of course, that's when the Mustang GT got its start. Um, into the 70s, <laughs> that quickly evaporated. In the beginning, beginning of the 70s, it kind of morphed into this big, bloated, personal luxury car, which of course was what was happening at the time, so it really wasn't a bad idea, uh, but it definitely didn't suit the character of the Mustang. Uh, then of course you had all the gas crisis shit going on, you know, people uh, starting to attract the economy, getting into trouble, people wanted smaller cars. Out came the Mustang too. 
which was this weird little shrunken downsized competitor to the Chevy Monza and uh, in fact I'm going to have to intertwine this a little bit, the history of the Cobra name, because of course we've got a Cobra here. So of course Cobra began with Carroll Shelby, although there's some rumor he bought it off, I think Crosley or somebody, for next to nothing, the name. And uh, of course made the first Shelby Cobra. Then he got involved with Ford, as you might know from that famous uh, recent movie, Ford versus Ferrari, which is very much worth watching. It's a great movie. And the Cobra name became a part of the uh, Ford nomenclature, more or less. It's still owned by Shelby, but it became a part of a Ford thing. And, uh, you know, in the 70s, the Ford knew it didn't really own anything by Carroll Shelby at that point, but it thought, you know, what the hell, nobody really owns Cobra, so we're going to grab that name. Shelby disagreed, by the way, and some argued that that might have led to his... Uh, uh, his, you know, relationship with Dodge in the 80s, the fight with uh, Ford over the Cobra name. I don't know. I haven't really sort of delved into that too much. But uh, Ford came out with the Cobra II, which was based on the Mustang II. And it was a little bit confusing because there technically was no Cobra One. I. I mean, the first Cobra was a Carroll Shelby product. So Ford didn't really have an original Cobra. They had Cobra jet engines, uh, but they didn't have a Cobra. But all of a sudden, there's this little Mustang II uh, with Cobra II badging. And uh, that was Ford's first Mustang Cobra. Um, it obviously wasn't really a muscle car. I mean, it had all sorts of swoops and scoops, and it was meant to look like the Shelby cars of the 60s, uh, but it was all hat and no boots. It just really didn't have anything underneath, and uh, that carried on for a few years. Uh, the 79 Fox Body Mustang started to turn the tide, and initially there was a Cobra model. Uh, but, you know, you're talking about all these sort of buzzy four-cylinder turbo engines that just weren't that good. Uh, then, you know, again, with more shitty gas crisis stuff, they detuned their V8 and they had a 255 in there and it just looked like everything was going to go south. And then in 1982, uh, they put the Windsor, the 302 high output V8 into the GT model and that turned the tide because Chevy immediately responded in kind uh, with an 83 HOZ28 and basically the horsepower race was on. Now you're talking about this anemic uh, crappy shit coming out of the uh, malaise era, but uh, all of a sudden in the early 80s, you've, you've got people talking about horsepower again. You've got people stuffing uh, yeah, more horsepower into cars than had been done in a few years. And uh, from that humble start of recompetition, uh, you know, now we've got 700 horsepower Mustangs and Camaros running around the streets looking for dominance while uh, dipshits, you know, crash into other people at cars and coffee events. So, um, you know, we can all thank the beginning of the 80s and the rebirth of the horsepower wars, even if it was <laughs> 180 horsepower. Uh, it was a big deal at the time. And, uh, of course, it led to something today. Uh, but this, this particular Mustang, the fourth gen, all almost wasn't going to be, uh, and that is what the focus of this video is going to be on. Uh, you know, it had done well, it started to do well in the 80s, it started selling well, they put the 302 in it, uh, sales went up for a while, they started going down, so Ford put gator back tires on it and a four barrel, and you know, that started boosting sales a little bit, and the whole Camaro V Mustang thing, uh, but by, you know, the mid-1980s, what Ford Brass saw was this aging tired platform of front engine rear wheel drive v8 you know stuff that was from the past and not the future uh, the bean counters at ford all loved mazda uh, ford was majority shareholder you know they had bought that and they came up with this plan to make the mustang a front wheel drive modern car based on Mazda MX-6 architecture and you know this was going on for a little while and it culminated right after April Fool's Day in 1987 Auto Week magazine published an outlandish scoop headlined exclusive uh, the 89 Ford Mustang and it had a picture of the what would become the probe <laughs> And, you know, they pointed out that it would be front-wheel drive. It would have this modern sort of, you know, four- or six-cylinder engine, no V8s. 
and people went batshit, or at least the Mustang purists did. And this is in the days before, you know, easy campaigns with emails and computers and Twitters and Instagrams and TikToks and all that shit. These people actually had to write letters, uh, which they did. They wrote shitloads of letters, and they sent them to Ford saying, you know, absolutely not. No way, not a chance. This cannot be what the Mustang's going to be. And uh, even more so, the enthusiasts inside the company were horrified. And uh, one guy in particular uh, sort of led the charge. His name was John Caletti. And he is something of a patron saint in the Blue Oval crowd. I mean, he's a really big deal. Uh, you know, he either sort of was on the team or led the team of any Ford vehicles that began with special vehicle. You know, you had SVO back in the 80s. You have SVT uh, in the 90s. And this was the guy who led it up. He was responsible. Baby. He led up the whole 2005 Ford GT, uh, which, of course, was an incredible machine, remains an incredible machine today, and uh, is truly one of the things that uh, dreams are made of. So he learned that Ford he, it was going to make this ST16 project, which is what they called the probe at the time, uh, the new Mustang. And he expressed his displeasure instantly to the the right people at Ford. You know, I mean, they, in a big company like that, there's always different factions. And uh, the biggest faction at Ford then was this whole momentum arrow thing, uh, you know, where they're going to change everything up. And then, of course, there's this older faction that wants to, you know, keep things going the way they are. It's big. Conservatives, for, I mean, it's what we got going on at Twitter right now. Uh, but anyway, the people that he expressed his displeasure to, let him set up what they call a skunk works project. And uh, that's termed that came from the old Little Abner cartoons for, uh, you know, something within a corporation that sort of set up privately and secretly uh, to develop something that may even be kept from the top brass. And they had to work in private because, uh, you know, the uh, bean counters, they just didn't want this thing happening. There was not any real funding for it. You know, whatever money they had was scraped and scrabbed together from, uh, you know, people who supported them. And uh, they even had to take it so far as to rent a facility out of the, the away from the Ford headquarters. They had to go off to a different uh, place in Detroit, and they worked after hours. They worked at night. Uh, you know, he assembled this dedicated team of Mustang enthusiasts that would try to keep the Mustang going. And it all came together very, very well, because the letter campaign going on against Ford, the, you know, outcry over making the Mustang into a front-wheel drive bit of nothing was really gaining steam. And at the same time, you have Coletti and his team in this place generating what they wanted to be the new Mustang. And even though they had no money to work with, they did the best with what they had. And uh, by the time that Ford realized they were making a mistake by fucking up the Mustang, Coletti had something to show them. Uh, he had taken the Fox body plant. You know, they look, when they make a new car, usually they have a billion, back in these days, they had a billion dollars and a clean sheet of paper. Uh, well, that wasn't going to happen in this case. So, uh, you know, they had a few hundred million, which sounds like a lot, but wasn't. And they had to create a whole new car out of it. So they took the Fox body platform, which, you know, was soldiering along. They made it wider. They made it longer. They stiffened it up and, uh, and they created something they could put this body shell on. Uh, they knew they couldn't afford to come up with any new engines, so they used the Windsor, the 302 out of the Fox body, uh, which by that time had become a very tunable, you know, a, what the small block Chevy had been for years. The 302 finally had become, and uh, they used that in the car. And they put some retro body work around it, a little bit of a retro interior, stuff that harkened to the original Mustangs a little bit more than the original Fox body did. And and when Ford decided, oh shit, okay, we better have a Mustang, well, there's Coletti with this product ready to show him. And uh, so the SD16 became the Probe, which is arguably one of the worst 
car names in world history. I mean, really, truly atrocious name. Uh, it was made for some kind of Ford show cars, you know, that had come years before, but <laughs> by the time the modern era came around, you thought of it in almost sort of a medical kind of way, uh, which just didn't suit the car. Uh, but the probe came out in 89. The Mustang, the Fox body, soldiered on for a few more years while they tried to figure out um, how to put this thing into fruition. And then in 1994, this car, this Mustang, against all odds, uh, debuted. And it, it, it was, you know, again, you could call it an instant hit. The Ford guys loved it. Uh, of course, the diehards who had done the letter writing stuff were so happy to see a front engine V8 powered rear drive Mustang that they loved it. Uh, people went out and bought it up. And uh, even though the Ford Probe was released to accolades, accolades from the press, they absolutely loved it. Uh, you know, it beat all kinds of other cars in, in uh, competitions. By the time 97 rolled around, the Ford Probe was on its final year of production, and this Mustang would outsell it 6 to 1. So it's very rare in giant automotive companies and, you know, automotive history that, never mind one guy, that'll never happen, but, but a team of guys can overcome the consensus, make a car, and have it work out. And uh, that is why this car is here today, and that is why Mustangs that, you know, came after this car, uh, are here today. The 05 Mustang, when it came out, it hearkened even more to earlier Mustangs, and uh, you know, it was just forever entrenched as something that Ford was going to do. So, anyway, I tell you what, I'm going to take a break there. That's the story of the uh, fourth gen Mustang and how it came to be in a very short, abbreviated way. One could get a lot more technical about that and specific, but gives you the idea. And uh, then we'll go around this particular car and uh, take it for a spin, and it's going to continue to be that very, very short video. So uh, hold on for just a moment. We'll be right back. All right, so we're going to dive right back directly into this car. I thought about doing a little bit of a history of 1998 because it was a fairly interesting year. Uh, you know, there was a lot of shit that went on that year. It was the year Clinton got impeached, if you remember all of that, the Monica Lewinsky stuff and, you know, the blue dress. Uh, it was also the year that he went after Saddam Hussein for having weapons of mass destruction. <laughs> we will say that might have been a distraction from his troubles at home, but eh, maybe not. Uh, either way, you know, Saddam was doing the WMD thing and, you know, people uh, decided that was no good. Um you know, it was a, there was an Asian financial crisis. They started building the uh, International Space Station. Um, you had all kinds of that crap going on. And films, you had Armageddon, you had Titanic, which was, to me, absolutely atrocious. You had uh, Saving Private Ryan, which, of course, was a terrific film. Um, something about Mary, which my sister keeps telling me I need to watch, and I never did. And... Uh, you know, some other, I think Godzilla, they made a remake of that that year. Uh, Musicians-wise, you had the Spice Girls, which again, love the plump red one. She's absolutely my favorite. Uh, you had Marilyn Manson, you know, Metallica was doing some crap, Aerosmith was doing some crap, and of course, eternally, Madonna is doing her thing. So, um, 98 was a fairly interesting year, but... You know, I didn't really prep for it and what the hell. So let's just continue on and get directly into this car. So the, here it is. So you had the Fox Body Mustang, which was very square, very sedan-like, and uh, very much not like any original Mustang of the past. So when Coletti put his team together, uh, one of the things that they did uh, was start to work that whole retro fad, which was, you know, the Beetle, the Mini Cooper, you know, all that stuff. And this is that predates it, of course, but uh, it was something that people were thinking about is making cars look like they did in the past. Uh, in a way that was just beyond normal evolution. It was more of a uh, an homage thing. And that's what happened. You see those big vents in the side at the rear. They're not functional because, you know, again, they didn't have a lot of money to work with. But you've got this swooping line down the bottom of the door going into this rear vent. And, of course, that is reminiscent of some of the Mustangs in the, uh, in the 60s. Uh, you've also got hood scoops on this one, which, again, I don't believe are functional. Uh, but the hood scoops were not standard to most Mustangs. It was a Cobra thing uh, that uh, only they had. But, um, you know, still, again, 
uh, hearkening to some of the hot rod versions of the Mustang in the past. Uh, in the front, basically, maybe the only thing that uh, looks like a Mustang is that prancing horse galloping Mustang in the center of the grill. And uh, otherwise, you've got an homage to the Ford Aero look, you know, from the Ford Taurus onward. Ford was very, very much dedicated to Aero. And whatever car Caletti and his team had to sort of put on paper had to fit into that motif. And uh, there you go. So you've got basically this unholy marriage of a classic Mustang and a modern era look. Uh, it's also taller. You know, the Camaro Firebird at the time was much sleeker and lower. Mustangs have always been, uh, you know, at least since the, you know, my, my Camaro Firebird went into sort of a low slung, you know, lie down while you're driving a car in the 70s and they continued that. Uh, Ford never did. They always kept the pony car thing going, uh, which acts much more like a sedan. You know, it's tall it has a taller greenhouse. It's maybe shorter, stubby tail, longer front end, but still not this big sleek thing that the Camaro Firebirds did. Uh, at the back, you've got the segmented taillights, another uh, Mustang thing, although they were not sequential at this point. They would go on to be that in the next generation. Uh, you also got a little bit of a rear spoiler there. And uh, this one being a Cobra, you get uh, Cobra stamped into the rear bumper uh, on the um, other one it would say either Mustang or Mustang GT and uh, of course some big twice pipes at the bottom so uh, cosmetic wise it's all it's a nice tight package you know again it's um, it's right now it's probably at that age where it's not really beloved by the classic car guys and it's not new enough for the current car guys so it's probably the right time to buy one you know at some point they're going to move into the classic department and people are going to start putting more value on them and i certainly wouldn't blame them i do think this car deserves it now the svt you know formerly svo special vehicles team uh the cobras became real in the 90s you know in the early eight they had a bunch of cobras even through the 70s and uh, you know the 80s and the early 80s but you know you get into in 93 they had the Cobra and the Cobra R and uh, these were real genuine frightening performance cars uh, they proved to be if not financially successful uh, they were great halo cars and uh, that mean you know they did they drove people to the dealerships because they were cool and people might have bought a lesser model because they loved the Cobra version and uh, they they decided to carry that over into this generation. So you see it's got the snake, the Cobra snake there on the side of the fender. And uh, of course the Cobra on the back, it's got the extra little hood scoops. It's got special SVT five spoke wheels. Uh, you can see that it's got big manhole covers behind the front brakes, at least for the time, those were pretty big brakes. Uh, dual piston and stopped the car very, very well. Uh, they also beefed everything up. So I tell you what, let's just start getting into it. We're gonna start inside the trunk. Grab my key here and we'll see what we got. Let me see the great blue oval there. Yeah, I tell you, I was never a Ford guy as a kid, but I've become much more of one in, in recent years. And, um, you know, I don't know, maybe I'm mellowing out as an adult. But you got a pretty decent sized trunk. Uh, you're going to fit a bunch of kids in there, no problem. Three, four toddlers, not an issue at all. Uh, you lift it. It's kind of the taillights are in the way, but I guess it would have been too heavy to work that into the uh, deck lid. So uh, you do get a nice little loading area in the middle. So you can fit all kinds of crap in there. Uh, pretty decent storage. And of course, mini sedan like. You know, in a Camaro, you had a big hatchback area. On uh, this thing, you got a trunk. But unlike many modern convertibles, you can actually fit some golf clubs in there and that you know works out pretty damn good so uh, what can I say it's a trunk uh, you lift up this guy here you get under here oh god everything's difficult anyway you're gonna find some spare tires and you know whatever else is under there let's have a look under the hood trouble opening this hood and it has a prop rod so this is going to be difficult we'll give it a shot oh god all right get this up 
All right, so here it is, and this is a pretty big deal. So this is a 32 valve. Uh, Chevy and GM, they kept the push rod, you know, engine going. They, they had a moment of indecision where, you know, they had that ZR1 with the four overhead cams and they had the push rod and they had to decide which they were going to develop and they finally went with the push rod. Ford went in the other direction. Uh, the first two years of this car had a push rod, had the 302 Windsor engine. And then in, uh, what was it, 96, uh, it got their new 4.6 modular V8 that was an overhead cam version. The Cobra version, like this one, ended up with four overhead cams and uh, it was an all aluminum architecture so the block and heads were aluminum the regular GT had an iron block and uh, two cams so uh, this was a fairly big deal at the time and you see the SVT badge there on the fender uh, this thing was also hand built they say you know like those AMG cars and it's signed by the two person team that put it together Yeah, who knows maybe maybe not uh, either way it was a pretty advanced pretty wild engine at the time I want to say this one put out about 305 horsepower, which, you know, is not much by today's standards, uh, but was probably 70 or 80 more than the standard Mustang GT had at the time, and uh, certainly enough to make the car a little bit radical. And again, I mean, it's pure muscle car crap. I mean, you've got this big V8 in the front, you know, sucking in wind, having a nice torquey time of things, made into a Borg Warner 5-speed, which is what you want. Uh, they beef up the suspension on the Cobra so it's a little bit stiffer at the front. Uh, they altered the live axle at the rear to make it a little more free-flowing with extra trailing arms and stuff. Uh, big brakes, big sway bars. Uh, you know, they made the thing have some road race credibility and the people who would drive them in racy situations say they're you know pretty good responsive cars and uh, not too bad for having basically a uh, you know a solid rear axle so um, all in all it's what car guys want certainly what muscle car guys want front engine v8 you know handshaker tough transmission able to hold in the torque beefed up clutch beefed up suspension you know, everybody loved all the Shelby GTs from the 1960s. Well, I mean, this car would lay waste to them on a racetrack or on a quarter mile or, you know, I, but it doesn't get the credibility for it because basically it was just more in times with uh, what was modern. You know, it was, it was easier for them to get horsepower and handling out of the car in 1998 than it was in 1968. Uh, so it doesn't really matter that it outperforms those cars. It doesn't have the same oomphy credibility that those cars do but it's still a pretty neat piece and it's still the classic muscle car formula and uh, I think that um, unfortunately it's something that's going to go the way of the dinosaur uh, eventually we're just not going to see any more of these things if you know now the Mustang's electric or they have an electric Mustang and uh, if that's not one of the horsemen of the apocalypse I just don't know what is so anyway I'm going to pause it again there I'm going to get my crap inside the trunk and uh, then we're going to hop in and go for a spin so uh, bear with me one moment all right so let's take this thing for a spin so look in 98 this car was 25 grand which was maybe a little bit more which was real money but not insane money and did follow the mustang formula pretty well and that's offering bang for the buck uh you know you didn't have to opt for the cobra which gave you you know, pretty hefty premium over the GT, but did add some pretty neat stuff. Uh, but they didn't make many of them as a result. I think there were, you know, about, I, I want to say about 6,000 Cobras in 98 and under, well under 4,000, maybe there was 8,000. Anyway, less than 4,000 were convertible. So we're talking about essentially a pretty rare car, uh, you know, particularly for something that wears a blue oval. And uh, that, of course, does help collectability uh, in, you know, modern times but that said, it gave you a lot for what you got in the traditional American style. You got your rear drive, you got your front engine V8, you got your vents in the sides, you got your swoopy bodywork. Uh, the interior, you know, it's cheap, it's typical Ford stuff, but it ain't bad. You got leather seats, which are pretty supportive and feel pretty good to drive. You got power windows and locks and that sort of thing. You got this chintzy, fake leather grain door panel stuff, but it seems to be holding together all right. 
um, you know, you get room for two people in the back with actually fairly decent uh, foot room, so your Canadians aren't going to be absolutely miserable back there. They'll be a little bit miserable, but not terribly so. And uh, they will have a nice bit of leather seating to, uh, to be in. So, you know, if you're on your way to a Marilyn Manson concert in 98, you could do so pretty comfortably in the back, smoke your doobies and, you know, snort your stuff or, you know, whatever it is that you had to do while you're heading to that. And uh, everything looking pretty nice back there. Uh, Convertible-wise, it's just a very traditional, standard, easy-to-operate, you know, American-style convertible top. You got two latches in the front and two big struts that uh, bring it down. And, you know, of course, in the 90s and beyond, convertibles were getting a lot more complicated, which was all very cool, uh, but you have to service them a lot. On a car like this, eh, you won't have to, and that means something. All right, so let's hop in this thing and see what we got. Uh, in here, you got a nice little map pocket. That's a good spot to, you know, fit a small 9mm while you're driving. Uh, up here in this uh, window triangle, you see this one has the Mach 460 sound system, uh, which is actually pretty good. So 460 watts. It's got woofers and tweeters and mids everywhere. And uh, it has a very cool radio, which I'm a little bit partial to because it's obviously built by Sony. And it reminds me of the one I had in my Firebird, you know, in the early 90s. But anyway. Anyway, we'll get into that. So, retro-wise, you now have, which the um, the prior gen didn't have, uh, this dual cowling setup with the two swoopy cowls on the uh, dashboard for the driver and passenger. Uh, that gave, uh, you know, the designers a nice place to stuff an airbag. Uh, but it also, of course, harkened back to the original Mustangs, and people liked that, and they still do today, and they've still continued that today. You see, they have the SRS in cursive. My, oh God, that's funny. So that means snowflakes can't read it. Uh, but that does say SRS if you went to Catholic school in the 70s. And uh, of course, a very big swoopy Mustang over there. Uh, you also get a very nicely laid out uh, set of white faced gauges. You've got 160 mile an hour speedo, which is not ambitious. This car would run uh, one, you know, in the 150s. Uh, you got, uh, and look at the red line on that big V8, you know, almost 7,000, which shows you that the thing was built for performance. It was built to rev. Uh, pretty cool stuff. Uh, you have a temp gauge over there. You've got your fuel gauge. You've got your voltmeter, and you got your oil pressure gauge. You know, all you need. Then you've got kind of this cheapy plastic fantastic stuff, but uh, you know, they would have had to make the car a lot more expensive if they were going to start fixing that. Uh, you have a pull handle um, headlight thing right out of the 1960s, except cheaper. Uh, this is a tilt wheel, which which is nice and it tilts back here uh, you know towards the cluster unlike Ford's they were just tilting right at the front of the wheel before that and I didn't like it that much I like this better uh, you've also got your um, wipers and shit there you've got a little bit of multifunction stuff for the cruise control uh, on the steering wheel and of course the Cobra script uh, over here you've got a very basic looking climate control system low high medium vent easy to operate easy to run but you know pretty cheap and then getting into that cool stereo system which I <laughs> I really have to admit I like it and it all works so it's no knobs which you know obviously knobs are cool but um, it is neat I, I secretly do love it and I love the uh, after um, thought CD player uh, at the you know, that was of course an expensive option this one still works too and uh, very cool stuff you also have this little flip down uh, cheapy thing to cover your 12 volt um, you know I don't know why it flips it why you know they're putting a picture of a cigarette on it but it's covered and there's no cigarette lighter in it so I don't quite understand that are you supposed to keep your cigarette lighter remotely uh, it's weird uh, they have pushed the shifter up towards the center stack of the dash which um, I'd like it to be back a little bit further because I feel like my fist interferes with it but it's fine and it's got kind of a cobra head on it which is neat uh, here's your ashtray which again you want talk about an afterthought it just fits in one of the cup holders uh, we do have um, books for this thing back at the shop including the certificate of authenticity from SVT saying that this is 
a uh, special version, the Cobra. And you do get a trunk release. Uh, you have a very standard looking e-brake. You've got your fog light switch in a very weird position here. This runs the top. And then you've got another 12 volt outlet here, uh, presumably for some kind of MP3 player in the 90s. And uh, a nice little center console area to stuff some crap uh, you know you can get all kinds of stuff in there you also got lights on the rearview mirror and uh, a couple of sun visors that have look at that there's there's typical Dalton he doesn't bother cleaning the mirrors so anyway it's nice that they're there and they light up and it seems like a bit of a luxury touch uh, for what otherwise feels like a pretty cheap interior right, let's fire this thing on that Ford Bing, which I'm not a fan of. Uh, nobody's ever modified this car, so this, uh, you know, the exhaust sounds pretty quiet. You do get a little bit of a V8 growl, which you'd expect, but um, truly a little bit tame for, you know, what uh, what you hear from Mustangs around the world, because usually people go put like straight pipes on them and they just sound so obnoxious you can't even hear yourself. Uh, I'm gonna run the top up. Let's see, we do that here. That's going down. All right, here it's going to go up, uh, which of course runs very, very simply, if slowly. I don't think people ran this top very much. Probably needs to be exercised a little bit. <laughs> anyway, this is like Peter's Gate. All right, there it is. So it comes up nice and easy. Uh, you know, easy in the sense that it's simple. You just click these little standard guys that could be out of the 1960s in it. Run your windows up. There's the backs. There's the fronts. And now we're fairly well sealed into place. So let's go for a spin. I'm also getting a little, little bit of AC going because of course it is humid today. And just a residue, an absolute residue of a sinister V8 sound uh, out of the back of this thing, which is, um, you know, enough to satisfy a muscle car guy when he's driving away from the dealership, but he's probably going to rectify that fairly quickly. <laughs> He heads home and puts some turbos or glass backs on it. Uh, you can also see the crappy windshield job. So immediately, uh, with the humidity, it starts fogging up. Thank you, Dalton. I also like the way you can see the little power bump uh, hood scoops out of the uh, windshield. I think that's a nice vista for the car. Oh, let me get the defrost on for a minute. Oh, for the love of God. Be able to see when we take this corner. See if that works. Not the fastest defrost in the world. All right, the hell with it. It's going. <sighs> Dalton, for the love of God. All right. Yeah, and at higher revs, of course, you get a better sound out of the. Um, out of the pipes and man like every Mustang with the V8 it just kind of encourages you to uh, drive it in a really aggressive manner I feel like just beating the crap out of it down this road but I'm gonna go easy on Peter and his neighbors And of course, that's the joy of these cars. I mean, they are, again, I know I keep saying it and it's boring to hear, front engine, very shiftable transmission, a rear, you know, pass traction, back end, you know, good handling, decent handling, and plenty of pep, plenty of torque on it. I mean, it's a classic muscle car formula. And then you add in a little bit of the modern suspension tweaks that make it, um, make it hand a little bit better. From what I understand, these things are kind of fun to take around a racetrack. So, you know, they're just a terrific driver's car uh, that um, you don't give them enough credit for because there's too damn many of them. <laughs> it's just a victim of its own success. All right, let's see if I can get myself into any trouble here. seven grand on the red 
friend of mine. Yeah, you know, I mean, that is fun. Without question, that is fun. And that's what makes these cars worth having. They're a joy dance. Tell me to slow down. I will. I will slow down. All right, I'll do that so I don't get a ticket. But that's what makes these cars fun to own, is you can just beat the shit out of them. And, uh, you know, go do donuts at the Walmart parking lot. Go, uh, you know, drift your way out of the Cars and Coffee event. If you're good, you can do it without hitting four other cars across the street. And, uh, and just have the time of your life on your commute to work. You know, just try to do it without getting any speeding tickets. So, anyway, there it is. I'll, uh... I don't know, we can do a highway drive. I, mean, I think I can get a highway drive in today. But yeah, yeah, but I, the steering's nice, it's tight, it's what you want it to be. The brakes are powerful. Uh, and again, you got plenty of pep under the hood, so there's instant throttle response. And uh, it just becomes a lot of fun to cruise this car around the boulevard. I know there's a lot of tweaks you can do to this engine to give it super horsepower. Yeah, fine, do it if you want. Otherwise, it's just fine the way it is. And uh, being a Cobra, being less than 4,000 produced, uh, even if it doesn't skyrocket, it should appreciate nicely and uh, become a fun collectible to drive around that doesn't absolutely break the bank. So uh, this one will be for sale at Auto House in Naples if you have an interest. And uh, otherwise, I'm going to come up with, I'm telling you, man, I've had a little bit of a lag. It's, it's hard to find stuff, but I'm going to try and come up with some fun stuff to do. And uh, we'll see if we can keep the videos rolling next week. So thanks for having a look. Really appreciate it. And uh, we will uh, we'll see you with the next one. Take care.